Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you, and welcome back for our final session of today's End of the Civil War Book Fair at the National Archives in Washington, D.C. I'm Doug Swanson, Visitor Services Manager for the National Archives Museum, as well as the producer for this lecture series. If you're just joining us here in the theater or on YouTube, our first speaker today was E. Lawrence Abel discussing his book, A Finger in Lincoln's Brain, What Modern Science Reveals About Lincoln, His Assassination, and Its Aftermath. Our previous speaker was Brian Matthew Jordan, who spoke about marching home, Union veterans, and their unending civil war. If you missed either of these sessions, they will soon be available on YouTube for on-demand viewing. Our final speaker for today is Joseph Whelan, and he will be discussing his book, Their Last Full Measure, The Final Days of the Civil War. Joseph Whelan is the author of eight books on early American history, beginning with Jefferson's War, America's First War on Terror, 1801 to 1805. He has also written about Thomas Jefferson and Aaron Burr, The Mexican War, John Quincy Adams, and four books on the Civil War. His latest is Their Last Full Measure. He holds degrees in journalism and English from the universities of Wyoming and Colorado, Denver. For 24 years, he was an editor and reporter for the Associated Press. He was part of a team that won the Associated Press Managing Editor's Investigative Reporting Award for stories about migrant children workers. His columns and articles have appeared in various newspapers, including the Wall Street Journal and magazines such as U.S. News and World Report and History Channel Magazine. Please join me in welcoming Joseph Whelan back to the National Archives. Thank you for the invitation, Doug, and the and the introduction, very nice introduction. So I'm here to talk about the last five months of the Civil War, January through May of 1865. A lot happened during this time. Um, 150 years ago, four years of bloodshed and destruction ended when Confederate Army surrendered at Appomattox Courthouse and Bennett Place. Much of the South lay in ruins, while northern industry thrived as never before. In human terms, the war's cost was staggering. Recently updated figures show that about 750,000 men were killed or died of their wounds or disease. During the war's final months, no major pitch battles were fought, except for the at Petersburg. But it was a time of shocks and pathos. The Confederacy's last viable port, Wilmington, was shut down in January when Fort Fisher fell. Congress passed the 13th Amendment, abolishing slavery, also in January. Union armies defeated the last operational Confederate forces and captured Richmond, Columbia, and Raleigh. Robert E. Lee and Joseph Johnston surrendered their armies, and President Abraham Lincoln was assassinated. Americans reeled under the accumulation of events and wondered what the future held. The Northerners were optimistic, Southerners were not. From the first day of 1865, perceptive leaders in the North and South knew how the war would end and that the end would probably come in the spring. Before the 1865 campaigns began, Lincoln got the 13th Amendment through Congress on the last day of January after a strong lobbying effort. Lincoln's opinions on slavery had evolved during the war. Emancipation initially was conceived as a war strategy. It freed slaves in the seceded states and undermine, undermining the Confederate war effort, and it freed and it discouraged France and England, which had already outlawed slavery, from supporting the Confederacy. But by 1865, Lincoln wanted to end slavery forever in America. In his magisterial second inaugural address, he said that the war might well be God's punishment for American slavery. For Lincoln, the deciding factor was the willingness of blacks to fight and die for the Union. By 1865, more than 180,000 black soldiers served in the Union Army. 
Preserving slavery was why the South seceded in the first place. But Jefferson Davis wanted to enlist slaves in the Confederate Army and emancipate those who served. Desertions and disease had thinned the Confederate ranks and it desperately needed fresh manpower. Davis's idea initially met with strong opposition in the Confederate Congress. By the time that it finally acted in March, it was too late. On February 3rd, three Confederate officials met with Lincoln and Secretary of State William Seward at Hampton Roads, Virginia to talk peace. The Southern commissioners might have been willing to conceive slavery was dead, but they could not agree to Lincoln's other condition that the South rejoin the Union. The conference was a failure. Still, many Confederate officials, Jefferson Davis not among them, were convinced that the war was lost, and they wanted to negotiate a, tr uh, a peace. Even Robert E. Lee believed defeat was now inevitable. With Davis's approval, Lee proposed a military peace parley with Grant on March 3rd. But Lincoln and War Secretary Edwin Stanton forbade Grant to meet with Lee for any purpose except Lee's unconditional surrender. In 1865, the Confederate Army was operating strictly on the defensive. It held Texas, the Carolinas, the Richmond, Petersburg area, and swaths of Louisiana, Arkansas, and Alabama. Union forces held Tennessee, Georgia, most of Virginia, and large parts of the rest of the Confederacy. Both sides recognized the fighting that spring would be decisive. As he had the previous year, Grant in 1865 planned several simultaneous offensives so the Confederates could not transfer troops from quiet sectors to threatened ones. General William Sherman would march his 60,000 man army through the Carolinas in Alabama, Grant planned to seize Mobile and the manufacturing center at Selma. But the main event would be fought at Petersburg. There, the Army of the Potomac would try to crack the line held since June 1864 by Lee and his vaunted Army of Northern Virginia. Before the campaigns began, though, the Union had unfinished business from December to complete, capturing Fort Fisher, North Carolina. The combined Army-Navy operation accomplished on January 15th what General Benjamin Butler had failed to do on Christmas Day. 10,000 soldiers and sailors overwhelmed the so-called Gibraltar of the South, defended by 1,500 men with a massive bombardment and infantry assault. Fort Fisher's capture sent waves of despair crashing through the South. It meant the loss of Wilmington, the last major southern seaport where blockade runners routinely landed food, ammunition, and weapons. Confederate Vice President Alexander Stevens called Fort Fisher's loss one of the greatest disasters which had befallen our cause since the beginning of the war. Jefferson Davis's administration was blamed the Confederate Congress demanded that Lee replace Davis as Commander-in-Chief. It also wanted General Joseph Johnston reinstated as head of the Army of Tennessee. Davis had relieved Johnston of that command in Georgia the previous fall. Both changes were made. Lee's Army of Northern Virginia was the last operational Confederate Army of any consequence, and it was in poor shape. Since June 1864, this army, which excelled on the offensive, had been confined to a 30-mile-plus long complex of trenches and forts circling around Petersburg and part of Richmond. On paper, 57,000 troops manned the defenses at Petersburg and Richmond. In reality, there were far fewer, and they faced 124,000 Yankees across the battle lines. Desertions and illness exacted a daily toll on Lee's army. Desertions particularly 
with the soldiers' impoverished families pleading with them to come home. Between October 1st and February 4th, an estimated 72,000 men deserted from Confederate forces east of the Mississippi. The rebels who remained that unusually cold winter shivered in thin uniforms and suffered from hunger. They lived amid mud and sudden death from sharpshooters and mortar men, punctuated every month or so by sharp, bloody battles. A Confederate staff officer wrote, at Petersburg, the fighting seemed to decide little, and the bloody collisions had no names. It was one long battle, day and night, week after week, and month after month. In May 1864, Lee had warned that if he were forced back into Richmond's defenses, it would become a siege, and defeat would be only a matter of time. Lee's prophecy was now unfolding. <clears throat> At War Secretary John Breckinridge's invitation, Lee analyzed the Confederate military situation in a confidential letter, March 9th. His appraisal was deeply pessimistic. Not enough food, men, or resources. If the situation didn't change, he wrote, the army would disintegrate and Petersburg would have to be abandoned. Congress invited Lee to Richmond to discuss the army's problems. Afterward, the congressmen said they were willing to make any sacrifice, but they proposed no action. That night, Lee returned to the family home in a black mood. He paced his study. Lee's son, General George Washington Custis Lee, said he'd never seen his father look so troubled. Lee stopped before his son and said, Mr. Custis, when this war began, I was opposed to it, bitterly opposed to it. And I told these people that unless every man should do his whole duty, they would repent. And now they will repent. William Sherman, who had occupied Savannah in December, he elected to begin his Carolinas campaign on February 1st and not wait for spring. Confederate leaders didn't think any army could operate in South Carolina in early February when heavy rains flooded the many rivers and swamps. Sherman believed his army could. We must turn amphibious, he cheerfully said, for the country is half underwater. Sherman's men waded the swamps and rivers, corduroyed roads with timber from the deep woods, and turned arsonist. This was no accident. Sherman intended to wage a total war on South Carolina, the seat of the rebellion. It would be worse than the march to the sea in Georgia. Sherman wished to make South Carolinians, he said, feel the hard hand of war as well as their organized armies. Sherman told Union Army Chief of Staff Henry Halleck, the truth is the whole army is burning with an insatiable desire to wreak vengeance upon South Carolina. I almost tremble at her fate, but feel that she deserves all that seems in store for her. In Georgia, Sherman had forbidden wanton violence and destruction. No such prohibition was issued for South Carolina. Sherman's men destroyed railroads, looted homes, and burned the public buildings in the towns along the marching route. Often the entire town went up in smoke too. After Orangeburg burned, an officer wrote, if the town had been built on purpose for a bonfire, it could not have been bettered. As in Georgia, they lived off the land. The Army's foragers, Sherman's bummers, ranged miles ahead to seize food for the Army. The bummers often clashed with Confederate troops who put up little resistance. Sherman noted the absence of the rebels' former terrible energy in combat. At Columbia, drunken Union troops burned down half of the city. During the night of February 18th and 19th, when citizen firemen tried to battle the fires, the Yankees destroyed their fire engines and cut their hoses. A witness said the streets were filled with shouting soldiers 
running house to house with flaming torches. Sherman had promised Mother Superior Baptista Lynch that her Ursuline convent and boarding school would be spared and protected. Sherman knew Sister Baptista from when she taught school in Ohio and uh, Sherman's daughter attended that school. But the convent was burned anyway. The next morning, Sherman encountered the Mother Superior outside of a church where she and her students had taken shelter. He said cheerfully, ah, there are times when one must practice patience and Christian endurance. She replied, you have prepared for us one of those moments, General. Sherman apologized and invited the sisters and their students to move into any home they wished in Columbia. Columbia burnished Sherman's reputation as a modern day Attila. When his army left Columbia for North Carolina, the city's women hissed, booed, and spat on the Yankees. At the North Carolina border, Sherman reined in his men, believing a strong pro-Union sentiment existed in North Carolina. However, in Fayetteville, Sherman leveled the U.S. arsenal and destroyed railroad properties, factories, and cotton mills. The reinstated Joseph Johnston had assembled a hodgepodge army of more than 20,000 Confederate soldiers from the Carolinas and Mississippi. At Bentonville on March 19th, they struck Sherman's left wing. The rebels showed spirit and drove back Sherman's men. But then Sherman's right wing arrived and the heavily outnumbered rebels withdrew to Smithfield. Sherman did not pursue them. Instead, his ragamuffin army marched into Goldsboro and received new uniforms and supplies. 30,000 troops from Wilmington joined Sherman in Goldsboro, giving him 90,000 men. Sherman regarded his army's 400 mile march through the Carolinas as its supreme achievement. Over 50 days in the winter time, his men had knocked the Carolinas out of the war while punishing South Carolina. Together with his Georgia campaign, Sherman had destroyed a large swath of the South's plantation system and desolated a vast region. In late March, the pace quickened outside Petersburg. On March 25th, Confederate General John Gordon, with Lee's blessing, attempted a breakout from Petersburg to join forces with Johnson's army. But Gordon's attack on Fort Stedman failed. Later that day, President Lincoln toured the battlefield on horseback, visibly moved by the mangled bodies. The President had arrived at Grant's headquarters at City Point the previous night to confer with his general in chief. At City Point, the last great military conference of the war was held on March 28th on Lincoln's steamship, the River Queen. Attending were Lincoln, Grant, Admiral David Porter, and Sherman, who had come up from Goldsboro. Grant described his plan to send Phil Sheridan's Cavalry Corps and the 5th and 2nd Infantry Corps westward south of Petersburg toward Lee's right flank. If all went well, they would cut the South Side Railroad, move around Lee's flank, and end the siege. Lincoln spoke of his post-war plans, intending, as he put it, the most liberal and honorable terms for the South. He told Sherman, Grant, and Porter, let them all go, officers and all. I want submission and no more bloodshed. Let them have their horses to plow with, and if you like, their guns to shoot crows with. I want no one punished. When the meeting ended, Lincoln asked Sherman, do you know why I took a shine to Grant and you? Sherman did not. Lincoln said, well, you never found fault with me. The Union campaign south of Petersburg began March 29th. When heavy rains turned the roads and fields into quagmires, Grant ordered the operation suspended until the roads dried out. 
but Sherman, Sheridan immediately rode to Grant's headquarters and talked him out of it. The campaign continued. Rather than further extend his line to the west to block Grant's offensive, Lee assembled a task force, 11,000 rebels, commanded by General George Pickett, who had led the futile charge at Gettysburg. Disaster struck Pickett again at Five Forks, south of Petersburg on April 1st. Sheridan's cavalrymen and the 5th Infantry Corps destroyed Pickett's task force. It was the Army of the Potomac's first major victory since Gettysburg. Five Forks also made Petersburg untenable for Lee's army. Grant ordered an all-out attack on Petersburg the next morning, April 2nd. When the attack came, a Confederate officer said, it swept through the rebel positions like a hurricane. At Fort Gregg, a few hundred rebels held off the waves of attackers for a short time. The North Carolinians and Mississippians fought with desperate ferocity with fists, fireplace bricks, and bayonets after their ammunition was gone. They accomplished their mission, though, buying time so that other Confederate troops could occupy a secondary line to be held until that night. But the Union onslaught succeeded in breaking Lee's lines. Lee had warned Jefferson Davis weeks earlier to be ready to evacuate Petersburg at a moment's notice. He now notified Davis that he must leave Richmond that night. Davis received the message while at Sunday services at St. Paul's Episcopal Church. Pale and grim, Davis staggered out of the church. Soon the news was all over Richmond, and anxious people began converging on the city's railroad depots. The streets were jammed with wagons full of luggage and furniture. That night, Lee's army evacuated Petersburg while Davis's government and Richmond boarded trains headed south. Richmond's tobacco warehouses were torched. The fires spread and gutted Richmond's business district. Retreating Confederates blew up the arsenal and destroyed the Tredegar Ironworks and the James River Naval Squadron. While explosions rocked Richmond, mobs looted the commissary and local businesses. The next morning, Union troops entered Richmond, put out the fires, and raised the stars and stripes over the Confederate capital. Northerners celebrated, Southerners despaired. Lincoln impulsively decided to visit Richmond on April 4th. It was incredibly dangerous, even foolish, to enter Richmond when it was not yet secured. The Union commander was not even informed that, Richmond, that Lincoln was coming. The president, his 12-year-old son, Tad, and Admiral David Porter arrived on the James River waterfront in a barge rowed, rowed by a dozen seamen. He walked through the ash-covered streets, the most recognizable man in America in his tall stovepipe hat. The new freedmen were astonished when they saw him. They fell to their knees and kissed Lincoln's feet. They flung their hats in the air. Hundreds of blacks crowded around the president, trying to touch his hand or clothing. But in central Richmond, the predominantly white crowd was silent and unwelcoming. When the Union commander learned that Lincoln was in the city, he dispatched a cavalry escort to bring him to the Confederate White House. There, Lincoln sat in Jefferson Davis's office chair and drank a glass of water. Petersburg's residents wept when Lee's army evacuated the city during the night of April 2nd and 3rd. The rebels marched through the night toward Amelia Courthouse to rendezvous with the troops that had evacuated Richmond. Food was supposed to await the hungry soldiers at Amelia, but due to a mix-up, they found no food there, only ammunition and artillery caissons. Lee would later say the day lost in trying to forage for food was the tipping point for his army. Meanwhile, Grant's army relentlessly pursued the starving rebels, 
uh, forced to march day and night. The rebels begged for food at homes along the way, and from the marching columns, they shot pigs, chickens, and cattle, and ate the meat raw. Desertions became epidemic, and stragglers swarmed the hills. The roadside was littered with the wreckage of Lee's army. Discarded muskets, haversacks, and canteens lay in drifts along the road. Abandoned wagons were found stuck in the mud, with trembling mules still harnessed to them. Sheridan's troopers savaged the rebel column, burning wagons and hanging on Lee's flanks like packs of wolves. There was no respite. A Confederate staff officer wrote, It was a period in which no note was taken of day nor night, one long, confused, dreadful day. The Confederate columns traveled at a glacial pace down the jammed roads without any rest. The rebels fell asleep standing up, waking long enough to trudge ahead a few yards more and fall asleep again. Confederate Major Campbell Brown wrote, the horrors and privations of the retreat have never been told. A desperately hungry South Carolina infantryman paid $10 for the heels of a butchered beef. Of, his, of the culinary experience, he wrote, the heels were gluey and sticky when cooked and was a nauseating meal, but it kept body and soul together. Sheridan's men rode ahead and smashed Lee's column at Sailor's Creek, cutting the rebel army nearly in half. Ranging ahead farther to Appomattox Courthouse, Sheridan's troopers succeeded three days later in blocking Lee's escape route to Lynchburg. The morning of April 9th, Palm Sunday, the rebel yell rang out over a contested battlefield for the last time when the remnants of John Gordon's second corps attacked Sheridan's lines. The keening cry quickly died when tens of thousands of Union infantrymen emerged from the woods behind Sheridan's men. The Confederates pulled back to a ridge. Gordon reported, tell General Lee I have fought my corps to a frazzle. He could do nothing unless he received reinforcements. None were to be had. When Lee was told, he said, then there's nothing left me but to go and see General Grant, and I would rather die a thousand deaths. Looking out over the fog-covered fields, he said with emotion, how easily I could be rid of this and be at rest. I have only to ride along the line and all will be over. He then composed himself. He said to his staff, but it is our duty to live. What will become of the women and children of the South if we are not here to protect them? That afternoon, Lee surrendered Grant in the parlor of Wilmer McLean's home. In a small irony, McLean had moved to Appomattox to get away from the war after his farm near Manassas became a battlefield in 1861. But the war had found him again. In keeping with Lincoln's desire for leniency, Grant gave Lee relatively liberal terms. While their cannons, muskets, and battle flags were collected, those Confederates who owned horses could keep them to plant the year's crop. Officers could retain their sidearms. The rebels would be paroled. Lee's men lined the road as he rode back to his headquarters after the surrender. Many of them wept aloud. Tears streamed down Lee's cheeks as he passed, hat in hand, bowing his acknowledgments. That night in the rain, rebel soldiers lay huddled together, silent and sorrowful. Grant later said that rather than feeling pleased, he was sad and depressed, as he put it, at the downfall of a foe who had fought so long and valiantly and had suffered so much for a cause, though that cause was, I believe, one of the worst for which a people ever fought. More than 28,000 Confederates were paroled on April 12th. Half of them 
had not fought in the final battle at Appomattox, but had instead roamed the woods and fields looking for food. In Richmond, people were heartbroken when they learned of Lee's surrender. Diarist Sally Brock Putnam wrote, we moved about little more than breathing automatons. Another woman wrote, oh, I wish we were all dead. It is as if the earth had crumbled beneath our feet. Lincoln returned to Washington and gave his last speech on April 11th from a second floor window at the White House. The crowd outside expected a triumphal recounting of Lee's surrender. Instead, they got a policy speech on Reconstruction. Lincoln made it clear that he wanted to heal the nation's wounds left by the war and not punish the South. And he believed the freedmen should be granted limited suffrage. Three days later, John Wilkes Booth shot Lincoln at Ford's Theater in Washington. He died the next morning, the first assassinated U.S. president. Andrew Johnson was sworn in as the 17th president while a massive manhunt was launched for Lincoln's killer. In the North, rage and grief replaced jubilation. The spirit of vengeance seized the Union Army. Union commanders in Virginia sequestered their soldiers so they would not attack nearby towns. Sherman's men heard the news while bivouacked east of Raleigh. About 2,000 of them began marching on Raleigh, intending to loot and burn the city. It had surrendered on April 13th and had so far been untouched. Union General John Logan blocked their way and ordered them to return to their camp. When they refused, Logan threatened to order the artillery, which was in plain view, to fire canister at them. The soldiers quietly dispersed, and Raleigh was spared. The U.S. Capitol was still unhinged over Lincoln's murder when Sherman's April 18th peace agreement with Joseph Johnson at Bennett Place reached Washington. Recalling Lincoln's words at City Point, Sherman had been generous, and the agreement covered civil matters, too. While Sherman was acting on Lincoln's sentiments, he was lacking a key piece of information, the March 3rd instructions to Grant, forbidding him to discuss anything with Lee except unconditional surrender. Sherman had not been sent a copy of the March 3rd telegram. At an emergency cabinet meeting where Secretary Edwin Stanton vehemently condemned Sherman's agreement, he sent copies of the agreement and his evisceration of it to northern newspapers. The newspapers pilloried the great hero of Georgia and the Carolinas as a traitor. Sherman dutifully met a second time with Johnston and signed a revised agreement on April 26, modeled upon Lee's surrender to Grant. In early May, Johnston's men turned in their flags and weapons in Greensboro and received their paroles. April 26 was also the day when detectives and Union troopers caught up with John Wilkes Booth. He was shot to death in a barn on a northeastern Virginia farm. President Andrew Johnson had put a $100,000 price on Jefferson Davis's head when it was alleged that Davis was complicit in Lincoln's murder. Davis was a fugitive now, traveling through the Carolinas and into Georgia. Right up until his capture in Georgia in early May, Davis still believed that the Confederacy might yet prevail. He spoke to disbelieving aides and generals of somehow reaching Texas and continuing the war. Union cavalrymen arrested Davis while wearing a woman's cloak and a shawl over his head. It later became a legend that he had tried to disguise himself as a woman. But in the dark, Davis had merely grabbed his wife Verena's cloak instead of his raincoat, and Verena had thrown the shawl over his head. Davis was in prison at Fortress Monroe, Virginia for two years before his first court appearance. When he was released on bond, 
He was thereafter never formally charged, tried, or linked to Lincoln's assassination. The Civil War radically changed this country, most tellingly in one respect, and it's oft repeated, but it bears repeating again. Before the war, people referred to the United States as a collection of near sovereign states, as in the United States are. Afterwards, the reference became the United States is. It had become a nation, but this was not immediately apparent. Because most of the fighting had taken place in the South, it was a desolated region after the war. Towns and cities in the Army's past had been looted and burned. The destitute were forced to survive on Yankee handouts. What factories the South had lay in rubble. Northern warships and commercial vessels plied southern harbors. A large swaths of southern farmland had been trampled by the armies, or they had been burned during the Union's prosecution of total war in 1864, or had gone fallow from neglect. Southern agriculture had not recovered for years. Indeed, northern leaders had brought the war to the doorsteps of ordinary southerners to destroy the South's resources and sap public support. Lincoln Grant, Sherman, and Phil Sheridan had waged a total war, targeting not just the Confederate Army, but the South's factories, farms, and transportation system. During the world wars of the 20th century, the strategy would be prosecuted in new, terrible ways. Except for the loss of fathers, sons, and brothers, the North had escaped the war's worst ravages and had, in fact, thrived. Its economy had rebounded from the financial panic at the war's start in 1861. By 1865, industrial production was at record levels. Clothing and weapons were mass produced for the first time. In one day, 38 northern arms factories were able to produce 5,000 infantry rifles, while the South produced just 100. During the war, the U.S. government spent $3.4 billion, which would be about $234 billion today, and acted with unprecedented authority. It drafted men into the Army, levied a personal income tax, printed paper greenbacks, had established a national banking system, and set aside 120 million acres of public lands for a transcontinental railroad. As an example of the North's vitality, in 1863 alone, 57 new factories were built in Philadelphia, and 7,000 new structures went up in Chicago. Commercial, rail, canal and seaport traffic soared. Hundreds of thousands of European immigrants poured into the north. Wagon trains rolled across the Great Plains. Financial houses flourished. New schools were established, Boston College, Cornell, MIT, Vassar. In parts of the north, one could almost forget there was a war on. When the fighting ended, Northern manufacturers switched from wartime to peacetime production. There began a half century of phenomenal economic growth, establishing America as a global power. But the market revolution that swept the North and, and West did not initially touch the South at all. The Southern economy limped along for nearly a century. With slavery banished, the plantation system collapsed. Great estates were broken into tenant farms. The Old South began to fade away. Years passed before something new began to fill the economic void, textile mills. Southerners who had survived the war nursed lifelong animosities for the Union. A bitter planner vowed that when he had children, the first principle of their education would be uncompromising hatred and contempt for the Yankee. Because they had prevailed, it was easier for Northerners to move on, but there lingered an antipathy toward the South. 
a feeling that it deserved what it had gotten. During a visit to Charleston, South Carolina, Navy Secretary Gideon Wells was struck by the poverty that had replaced the city's former luxury and refinement. He wrote, having sown air, she has reaped sorrow. She has been and is punished. I rejoice that it is so. Civil War was a bright line between the American antebellum era and the beginning of a new age. Before the war, there had been two distinct Americas, a slower paced agrarian, chivalrous South, and the ambitious, industrial, forward looking North. The war had greatly widened the gap between them. The changes wrought by the war amazed those who perceived their totality. As a Harvard professor put it, it does not seem to me as if I were living in the country in which I were born. There you have it. Thank you. Is it true that the soldier who shot uh, John Wicks Booth did it against direct orders that he was to be captured alive? Uh, yes, that's true. Uh, they wanted to do that and put him on trial. But he, this soldier, who was a rather strange guy, um, thought he saw Ray, uh, Booth, who had a Spencer rifle inside the barn, raise his weapon uh, to fire at a Union soldier, so he shot him. Thank you. Folks, as were for the two previous authors, there's a book signing right outside in the theater lobby. They're selling the book there as well. We'll see you there in just a couple minutes.